Okay, let's start the second session. Uh, before we start, however, I have a, one announcement or encouragement to presenters. Uh, you can still log into the web page, ICFP web or ICFP web page for the Hope Workshop and set up uh, accompanying materials to your talk. For example, you can uh, link to your uh, uh, paper, to your slides, or to any, any anything else that you think might be relevant to to your talk. So please, I mean, I know there is still I mean a time, and please do that. I hope that you consider it. Okay, so the first talk of the second session is by Willem Heilkes on functional machine calculus. So Willem, please. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, pleasure to, to be here, so to say. Um, so this is about um, a new model of combining high order computation, lambda calculus, with effects. Um, so a quick overview of the history. Um, since the 60s, we know how to do call by value with so eager evaluation plus some constructions to delay evaluation. But that's um, that's not all we want. We've seen how to do it in continuations, uh, call by name with monads. There's this line of work, um, Kappa calculus, that might be familiar. Premonoidal categories may be a little more familiar. Haskell arrows, I suspect, is familiar to most people. Um, then we have call by push value and friends, and recently effect handlers. So this is a quick overview of um, what paradigms we have floating around, um, and I don't think this is exhaustive at all, um, for um, sequential higher order computation with effects. Um, and the functional machine calculus fits into this, in, in, into this um, series, as it were. I, I, I would put it above effect handlers I put it in, in here. Um, what are the requirements of a, a model of uh, computation uh, of this kind? Well, first it needs to express multiple strategies, right? You want to have lazy and eager evaluation, and you want to have that in the syntax so that the programmer can decide uh, when the effects are called. Um, and sort of less strictly, but in practice very relevant, is that you would want an intuitive notion of sequentiality because effects are sequential. At least we are talking about um, sequential computation, of course. There's also a, a separate branch of concurrency, that, that's, but it's not about that. So we want sequentiality. So um, this work starts by observing, well, bit reduction is not sequential, right? And that's the reason why we have all these different paradigms. But um, call by name evaluation with a simple stack machine is sequential. So the lambda terms do have a notion of sequentiality in them, and that is the spine. So an application, MN, pushes the argument and then continues as M. So the, this is an operation, and the sequentiality is to do some, to, to yeah, is continue on the M, so that on the spine. And an abstraction pops a value N and continues as um, M with N substituted for X. So I'll write this as prefix. So the spine of a term, which is here the here continues as M, and here as well continues as M, uh, is a sequence of machine instructions for a simple call by name stack machine. So the first thing, um, so the functional machine calculus will feature two generalizations of lambda calculus, and the first thing I need to do is to adapt the notation so that I can add these. Um, and the, this notation emphasizes the, um, the stack operations. So it's the same thing, but written differently. It's a push operation pushing n and a pop operation popping as x. Um, that's it. it. Just a change of notation to make everything, um, to, to make the machine perspective more intuitive. Um, so then we have stacks, which I write. I put the, um, the elements, the head, to the right. And that's because um, then a, a sequence of these uh, push actions will produce the stack in the same order. Um, and states are a stack and a term. And then the, these are the transitions. So this is just a formalization of the in, in intuitive stack machine that I just mentioned. So this is a, a push, and this is a pop and substitute. And terms 
look slightly differently. So for instance, the, the, um, the S combinator will look like this, and this is two applied to zero, it will look like this. So look like the argument goes to the left. So it takes, takes some getting used to. Um, but the payoff is that we get a notion of sequentiality in our terms. Um, and we can make an observation here. So the spine of a lambda term right, becomes, that's simply the, the top level sequence here. And so this is, this is another lambda term. So this is also a, a separate spine. Um, a spine is a sweet sequence of actions that ends in a variable. A variable ends the spine and it must represent all of the remaining computation. Um, when you look at this as an instruction sequence for this simple stack machine, that is a really weird restriction. Um, for the machine, it would be absolutely fine to have variables um, in the middle of the spine. And it would just, you can put a, a sequence of instructions using substitute sequence of instructions and continue um, after doing that. So this is what we do. Um, the first change to the lambda calculus, uh, I've called this the sequential lambda calculus, is this. Um, the variable, the usual variable construct, is split into um, a, a null term, an empty. This represents the empty sequence of instructions. And the variable now becomes a prefix. Um, and just like the um, push and pop actions. So now we have, um, now we can build any sequence of push actions, pop actions, and variables into a term. So here are some examples. Um, so this, pop, this pops something as x and then pushes it twice. This pops two things and does nothing. And well, let's first change the notation a little because those dot stars are getting in the way of, of reading what it actually does. So I'll omit those, the trailing dot stars. And then you can see, well, this is, it um, pops X and pushes it twice. This pops two things. And this is the identity. It um, pops something and pu pushes it back. So the identity um, for non-empty stacks, um, that is pushed onto the stack. It's read and bound and executed three times. So the thing to note here is that these are not Lambda terms. These are... Um, this makes no sense at all as a normal lambda term, but as a, a sequence of machine instructions, it is absolutely fine. There's no problem with this at all. Um, and what do we get? We get some nice things. So uh, here is um, notion of composition, right? Because we are talking about sequences of effects. Um, with variables anywhere, we can now compose them. So semicolon for composition, and this is the definition. And note that we have to do capture avoidance, right? If we compose something, then uh, X here binds in N. And if you put all those actions in sequence, it might bind in N as well. So we need to do capture avoidance, and that's this. Substitution is as expected, and the special case, the new variable case, um, substitutes for x and substitutes in m, and the the prefixing becomes a composition. Of course, as expected. Um, and then beta reduction is as normal. So features of this design. So variables now, so the main change is that variables are something different. Variables no longer represent um, lambda terms, they represent sequences of instructions. Um, in a way you can see this as variables representing computations and not values, but th that's, um, um, that's both helpful and um, could also be confusing. We get the notion of composition and the unit and empty sequence and it's conservative of lambda calculus if we if we restrict ourselves to those sequences where um, the variable and the units always occur together, um, we just have lambda calculus again. But this is the really nice thing. Um, 
And with this simple change, you can encode um, call by value lambda calculus, the monad approach, the computational math language, call by push value, and arrows. So it's a very simple change, but it um, it just these other paradigms in an easy way. And I'll I'll show two of these. Um, so here is how we would uh, encode call by value and number calculus. So this is the call by value and number calculus. Values are variables and abstractions. And then a reduction requires that the argument is uh, a, a value. Encoding is as follows. Um, a variable becomes a push action on a variable. And an abstraction adds a push action as well. So what's happening here is that instead of um, instead of return, so to return a value, right? A value is a something that is returned by the computation, and to return something, we push it on the stack. Just quite a normal thing to do. Um, and note how this is this is not expressible in normal lambda calculus. And if you want to um, do these kind of things, normally you'd have um, you'd have continuations. You need a continuation to do that. Um, but here, we can simply have a term that consists of a push action and nothing else. And the same here. And then for um, application, so this, this one evaluates the argument first here. And you can swap these around. You can do encode uh, function first evaluation by turning these around and filling a bit with it. Um, but this is the easy one. So argument first, function second, and note that if this is a function, then it will be, um, it will be, it will evaluate to a push action. So the, this, um, evaluating this term will leave the function m pushed on the stack. So then we need to execute it. So we pop it and we run it. And that's what we see in reduction. So um, here is the reduction step again. And if we have, um, if this value translates to this push action, then what happens is, well, we, we push n, we push the function. Oh, this should have a, okay. yeah, that's all right. And here is the evaluation. So the reduction here is, this is the red X which just substitutes um, m for y. And that exposes this red x, which becomes a substitution. And that's, that all works out. Um, we also encode monads. So in the meta language, it's written like this. In Haskell, it's written like this. So there's two operations. Um, the return operation and the the, um, the bind operation. Here it's used as a, as a let, and in the Haskell you can do it without having an explicit variable. Um, but anyway, that's fine because we can we can encode this easily as well. It turns out this is just um, its composition. Oh, I, I should say I've. Um, this is really a, a semicolon, but I'm I'm lazy and I'm just using dots everywhere. So I'm using dots. I'm overloading dot for um, prefixing and composition. So I hope that doesn't um, throw anyone off. So the the idea is, as in call by value, the return of a monad is a it's pushing its its return value onto the stack. And the let is a construct, or the, the bind, is a construct that evaluates the this first and then continues with that. And it pops the result of, of that computation. And it's immediately, uh, it's, it's very straightforward from the translation that the reduction works. So this, so, um, return this and then bind it in M, um, this would evaluate to that. 
And that's also what happens here. It's very straightforward. All right, so now, so we have our um, encoding of uh, strategies. What uh, do we do to add the effects? So here's another observation. Basic effects, like input, output, and state, can be encoded with pop and push actions. Input is, um, reading from input is a pop, writing to output is a push, and states can be modeled as stacks of depth one, where update is first pop, discarding the value, and then pushing the new value, and lookup is popping and binding, and pushing the same value, the, the pop value back to restore the state. The, um, but what's different from normal lambda calculus is that every effect uses a different stack or string. So that is the second change. Um, we parameterize our abstraction and application, application and abstraction, in a set of locations. And each location represents an effect. We have a main location, central location, which is uh, sort of omitted from the notation um, for, um, for the general application and abstraction. And then we can encode these various effects um, by adding more locations. So overall, we have a lambda calculus with two generalizations. First, sequencing, which we've seen before, split the variable into a unit and the variable with a continuation here. Yeah. And the second is to parameterize the abstraction and application as push and pop actions in a set of locations. Yeah. So here's some examples. So this could be a random generator, and this could be output, and this function would read from random and output that value. And this would do that. It would, it would um, store that function on the stack, pop it as f, and execute it three times. So this would take three random values and output them. And here is something, something weird. What does it do? It reads a function. Uh, it reads from a memory cell C. It puts the value of um, it found at C onto the main stack, applies F to it, reads the um, result of F, and pushes to C. So this applies, it, it takes a function F and applies it to the value stored in the memory cell C. Uh, the stack machine for this is, is as expected. Um, in, we have a memory which is a family of stacks, so one stack or stream for every location, and I'm writing them with a semicolon, and then I'm immediately breaking that notation for convenience. I'm not doing it here. So states are pairs of a memory and a term, and the transitions um, are as before, except they operate on the um, uh, on the stack indicated by the location, and that's it. You push to that stack, and you pop from that stack, and everything else is as before. And then we can check that the encoding of state um, works as um, as the intuition would uh, suggest. So. Um, we can model a memory cell by location C. We don't have to restrict it to uh, to be uh, to have at most depth one or exactly depth one, because the operations will make sure of that. So an update, um, which I've written with the continuation with the remaining as, as a prefix instead of a separate thing, but it could just be um, a separate um, operation is pop and discard, so this is a non-binding variable, um, push n and continuous n. And lookup is push, sorry, pop from C, restore that value to C and execute it. And the machine, the stack machine, shows you that that um, operates as expected. Right? The, the transitions are um, what's needed. So here's an example. This is um, fill, this is without um, sequencing. So this is an example that's within the normal range of the, the lambda calculus with effects. 
the encoding here. So the example, uh, it's assigns, it has a memory cell A and it sets it to two. And then it has a function and an argument. The argument will set A to three and return zero. And the function will throw away the argument and read A. So this is to illustrate the uh, divergence between call by name and call by value. The call by name evaluation would throw away this update. Um, and so it would read two here. And the call by value reading would execute it. And so it would read three. And this is the, um, well, what happens is this is the encoding. The update comes here. The argument to the function is a push action here. The, here's the abstraction and here's the read A. And to produce that in the machine, um, it, it's, a, it's a very straightforward series of steps. Um, we have to initialize the, um, the stack for A with a, uh, with a dummy term so that we can pop here so that we can even start. But if we do that, then we update. So the first thing is to update um, A with two. Then we have the, the Redex, which is, uh, so it, this is pushed onto the main stack, the Lambda stack, and then uh, discarded in this step. And finally, this read operation, it reads from two and restores it. The introduction in this calculus needs to um, account for the multiple stacks for the enlarged memory. And that means we have to um, allow other abstractions and applications in between a Redix. So this could be actions that operate on other stacks, not on A, um, but they can't be variables or they can't be actions on A. And then we have a, a Redix that goes like that. Um, and here's a theorem. Um, this reduction is confluent. And is, is that surprising? Um, do, we, do we have a response? Is, is anyone surprised by that? Let's see if people are still paying attention. My, uh, my referees surely were. Um, is this not a mystic? Sorry, I may have missed. Sorry? Is the reduction non-deterministic at all? It, it's, it's just speech reduction. It's non-deterministic. It's um, It happens anywhere. It's a rewrite relation. So you are surprised. Uh, slightly. <laughs> so, um, so this is why. Um, this is why it can be um, confluent. So, B to reduction does not evaluate effects according to their operational semantics. So we have, on the one hand, we have this stack machine, right, which operates B to reduction as the Graveen machine, and it evaluates effects by their operational semantics. And on the other hand, we have B to reduction, which is sort of an optimization when you look at the machine. Um, and if you apply B to reduction to the encoding of effects, this is not the operational reading, you get the algebraic reading. So this is what happens. Um, if you encode two successive state updates, they are they become two um, sequences of, of uh, pop and push actions, and they interact. So the, the push action of the first and the pop action of the second form a redex that reduces. And that reduces according to the algebraic laws for effects. And similarly here, um, the um, a, a state update followed by a read action is the same, is algebraically equivalent to uh, the same update followed by executing that, um, the, uh, the updated value. And the same thing happens here. This is a, um, a sequence of pop and push actions, and the uh, at the boundary, they interact, they form a Redix, and they give you the um, expected uh, algebraic operation, uh, the, yeah, the, the result of that algebraic equation. 
Um, so here's an example, the same example. Um, for instance, in this we, in this um, term, we can see that this uh, push action is adjacent to that pop action. So there's there's actions on other stacks on the main stack in between, but that doesn't matter, right? We know that these don't affect this red X. So this is a red X, and we can update that, and then we have to we can do that one as well. And we see that the um, the term reduces to the um, to this action, to this term, update the state to two, and return two. So quickly, um, the other effects. So input and output um, reading is a pop action, and writing is a push action. Nothing spectacular about that. Um, to get going with a stack machine, we need to have a stream of inputs. And for beta reduction, we need a context to run an applicative context. Um, and then we can do probabilistic choice and non-determinism as in the same way by having a, a random generator or a non-deterministic generator represented as a stream of inputs. Okay, I'm I have four minutes, I think. Um, I'm not going to make it to types, but I'll do a bit of programming if um, if you'll allow me. So, how would you program with this calculus? Um, so we've seen in with monads and with call by value that um, the return values are encoded by um, pushing them onto the stack. Um, and this is the natural way of programming in this way. So the lambda calculus leaves the return value as uh, an unev unevaluated remainder of the term. But that doesn't that doesn't work well in this setting because if you compose right so you you if you have that that value and then you want to compose that with the remaining computation then you can't pick it up it it's just there it's it's blocked reduction is blocked the machine is blocked um it, it's just it's done so instead what we what you would do when programming this is you would do as in call my value and as as in the monadic encoding you Put your return values on the stack, and then you can compose with a function that pops it again. Um, so this is what we expect. A term um, m should be considered as taking input, an input stack s, and then producing an output stack t, or an input memory s and input memory t. Now, I'm dropping the locations when it's convenient um, because they're just they're, they're very they're straightforward and just clutter things. So then we have uh, the empty um, term as identity, and we have uh, a notion of composition. Uh, composition is composition. So from if we have a term n that takes r to s, and we have m that takes s to t, then uh, composition dot or semicolon will take r to t right, in in the machine. That's just what happens. Okay, let's add some primitives. Um, they will work just as expected. Um, a, a plus will take the top two items and add them and return uh, a skip. A conditional will read three values, and the last one is the Boolean that determines uh, which it takes. Oh, that's one of these should be an M. I clearly, couldn't decide which. And we can do inequality in the same way. And then you get, um, for this, for arithmetic and boolings, you get a simple standard stack calculus, which um, where these are pop and push actions, as you would implement a, a calculator. Then for effects, um, we wouldn't do the encoding as before, but we would use a, a separate get and set actions that operate on the stack. So you get would read from memory, put um, restore the memory and put it put the red value on the main stack for use by the next function. So get C it, it, it it's a read operation from read from 
memory and it puts the value on the stack instead of evaluating it as before. And set C is the same as before, except um, it reads it, uh, its argument from the stack. Um, a print is, is convenient to have. It reads from the main stack and uh, pushes to output. Um, read takes input and puts it on the main stack and random similarly. And uh, definitions or lead bindings can be encoded as relics as, as normal. And then we can um, write something intelligible. Um, so we define f as a function that takes a random number, sets the location c to that value, and then reads from c again. So that's the definition of f. Then that's executed twice. Um, the output of that, which is what it got from c, that is added, and that is printed. And I will go through this quickly and end here. Um, this works. So here's the beta reduction. It reduces, it reduces inside arguments, right? So it's, it, it's, it reduces anywhere um, to basically to um, optimize the function f. Um, and here we've optimized f and we can uh, uh, duplicate it here and then it interacts with itself. Um, here we're done. We're out of relics. We're in all form. Uh, we take the machine, and it's a simple sequence of stack actions. So we, we have a, a random generator, which presents two numbers. And we have a, a location C, which is initialized with a null term. And we, we read from random. Uh, we pop the... C location. Um, so the random we read was seven. We put seven on the main stack, well, etc. etc. And the main thing is um, it ends up with having put six. So the last read value in C, right? So C is updated with the last read random value for every execution of F. Um, and we've added the outputs. So it's a 13 and put it to output. So I'm, I think I'm out of time. I would love to do the rest, but um, some other time maybe. Okay. Do you have a conclusion slide? Uh, no, the conclusion slide says thank you. So I'll, I'll, okay. I'll conclude with that. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, well, thank you. So it's a good conclusion. So we uh, really don't have time. And so uh, probably it's better to have a discussion in the lunch or in the chat. Well, let's That's thank it. the speaker again. Uh, and now we, to the next speaker is uh, Timothy Tomandl and uh, Dominic Orchard. Well, Timothy, Timothy would be the speaker and uh, joint work with Dominic Orchard. Hello? Timothy? 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 